ever, the news cycles have been running cold and cruel story after story. And it's been a long winter. We need to remind ourselves of what makes us tick. What makes life on this miserable blue orb worth living? So I've decided it's time we talk about my favorite subject. Gay people trying to murder each other. Love. Love is a powerful, intimidating force of nature. It's what makes us scary, act in unpredictable ways. It motivates unimaginable violence. But it also encourages us to make the most of ourselves. To become. No one can be fully aware of another human being unless we love them. By that love, we see potential in our beloved. Through that love, we allow our beloved to see their potential. A lot of people have pointed out the similarities between Brian Fuller's Hannibal and Phoebe Waller-Bridge's Killing Eve. They're both about suave murderers with a taste for the finer things in life, who fall for a sweaty fed that obsesses over serial killers in unhealthy amounts. But the parallels between the two go deeper than that. Their three season arcs almost ping pong off each other. They're unique queer stories, not defining either character by their sexuality and political expectations, but rather by their intense humanity and destructive love for each other. Why do we root for dangerous love? There's not a simple answer, but it can be explored through further questions like, what do these shows reveal about love, say about trauma, healing, and vulnerability? And how does violence shape love? As Will and Eve's becomings drive them to murder, they inspire humanity and mark Hannibal and Villanelle as mortal, capable of emotion. No matter what we've done, we're all capable of great acts of love, and that should scare you more than any monster. Despite their reputation, Hannibal and Villanelle are not psychopaths. Yes, they're sexually magnetic, seem to operate on an inhuman moral code, and manipulate others around them to serve their own ends. Now, this isn't a psychoanalysis video, but they're also both capable of remorse and other feelings. And as the writers of the shows themselves describe, their mentality defies categorization, but they certainly draw upon the likable sociopath trope. The Take has a fantastic video detailing more on how Hannibal and Villanelle charm us with their flashy homicidal wit. But what charms us most about them is their joy. Hannibal sees life as something precious, something to be savored to its fullest extent. He loves fine things, and so does Villanelle. She has this childish delight that sugarcoats her callous greed. If she doesn't get what she wants... <laughs> their affable demeanor makes it even scarier when the mask slips and we see them hunt. <laughs> Differences in disposition come down to age and maturity. Hannibal's tranquil, cordial tone and emphasis on manners comes with his older paternal nature. Whereas Villanelle is charming the way a cub is charming. In a way, she's a younger Hannibal, comparable to his time in Florence as Il Mostro. They see humans as pigs, livestock for them to play with. But unlike the Joe Goldberg type, their murders aren't motivated by love. You can't be intimate with someone you don't respect, and you don't respect someone who you abuse. Now, before you object, as you should, it's important to understand the mechanisms of the genre. Joe Goldberg is an abusive man in a normal world. I'm worried. I've seen enough romantic comedies to know guys like me are always getting in jams like this. Look at that. How dare she invade your privacy? He sees his relationships with distorted double standards and delusions. His partners aren't playing by the same rules or even the same game as him. Hannibal and Villanelle's violence operates under a much less literal interpretation. It follows the conventions of gothic horror and spy thriller media. Murder is the M.O. of their worlds, and they encourage reciprocity in their relationships, rather than trying to enact terror. As we see, their fascination with Will and Eve actually grows into genuine love. By the end, they're willing to sacrifice everything they value for them. But how do two cold-blooded serial killers get to this point? With all my knowledge and intrusion, I could never entirely predict you. I can feed the caterpillar, and I can whisper through the chrysalis, but what hatches follows its own nature and is beyond me. They love the complexities of Eve and Will, the way they manage to outwit them and navigate their way through their minds. I can't stop thinking about you. They're obsessed with them, changed by them, and then shocked by that change. And they encourage them to take charge, 
to see their full potential. When they find out their MOs are incompatible with the family that they seek in their partners, they try to replace them. And if they were true psychopaths, they could do just that. That's what they're able to do to their scarred pasts with Anna and Chio. But the role they sought from them can't be fulfilled by someone as complex as Will and Eve. Will is more than a mercenary, and Eve is certainly not a mother. Even the ones who seem to understand them the most, Hannibal's therapist Bedelia and Villanelle's mentor Constantine, know their style and profession well, and they play along, but they ultimately disapprove of their methodology and see them as dangerous and underdeveloped. But for Will and Eve, who see them as they truly are, they certainly show their true colors in protective contempt. A contempt that comes out of a transformation, out of loss after loss, and violent love. Will and Eve honestly have to be two of my favorite characters on TV. They're adorably obnoxious, determined, brilliant, and incredibly true to themselves. How would you kill me? I'd paralyze you with saxotoxin and suffocate you in your sleep. Chop you into the smallest bits I could manage, boil you down, put you in a blender, then take you to work in a flask and flush you down a restaurant toilet. In an interview, Hugh Dancy describes Will's intellectual perception. He says, It's like his whole life he's been not only a great chess player, but in fact the only person in the whole world who knows the rules to chess. Then another person walks in the room who's also a genius chess player. And that sense of relief and gratitude and recognition is powerful. There's a kind of feeling of falling in love. Like, oh my god, I see you. I really see you. Two protagonists who are defined by their ostracization and disconnect from society manage to be the most relatable and empathetic characters on the show. Neither of them can be satisfied with an ordinary life because of their fascination with violence, more specifically the art of the kill. Their attempts at normal lives with normal partners soothes them, but also builds an unbearable boredom and hunger. Eve embraces her love of female assassins from the start, whereas Will is resistant at first to his ability to empathize with serial killers. Will enjoys killing as the show goes on, embracing his true self, but Eve doesn't share the same appetite, and she eventually disillusions Villanelle from a life of murder. Both are seen as righteous for their obsessions, yet neither of them seem to have any actual loyalties when push comes to shove. It's what sets them apart from the traditional anti-hero, and sends Will specifically into more villain-hero territory. They realize they're pawns in a game being played by people with far different and more corrupt motivations than them, in a world where no one seems to hear them. Jack and Carolyn are sympathetic and care about them, but to a certain extent. While the mysterious organization The Twelve is pulling the strings and killing Eve, Hannibal is the puppet master of his show, blinding everyone around him for his own ends and getting away with it, with a feminine masculinity that one can only describe as off-putting and European. I really appreciate the thematic differences between the two shows. I mean, after all, they're sister shows, not identical twins. In their contrast, I think we get an even larger picture of the queer experience, especially when dealing with trauma. Villanelle clings to Eve as a maternal figure at first, but she quickly proves she's not the nurturing type, stabbing her when confronted with vulnerability. Her response is fight, then flight. Similarly, Will is encouraged by Hannibal to act on his paternal impulses to Abigail, but he's more motivated by the guilt of orphaning her. They both try to fit a heteronormative familial role, but their true selves are meant to break convention. Neither are capable of being caretakers, failing to protect their loved ones in search of their murderous soulmate, which is their most fatal flaw and biggest motivation. They too are unable to live without the passion and motivation of Hannibal and Villanelle, who in turn test the depth of their true nature. Villanelle forces Eve to reevaluate her shaky safety net by killing and threatening her loved ones, and Hannibal goes to the extent of driving Will to alienate everyone in his life. Listen, nobody's perfect. But in the grander scope of a game where anyone and everyone will die, they're awakening Will and Eve, showing them their own true impulses that they will never have and will never want the life expected out of them. Do you believe you could change me the way I've changed you? I already did. And they change them in turn. Eve shows Villanelle something she has never received before, unconditional love. Love in spite of everything that makes her a monster. And that's enough to ruin the taste of blood for her. 
to show her that she is more than the killing machine she was molded into. Eve doesn't need a murder metamorphosis because she is Villanelle's knight and savior. For Will, he shows Hannibal the possibility of equals, the joy of not being able to predict what happens next. He gives him a taste of his own game. And they are a zero-sum game. Neither can take anything from the other without ultimately depriving themselves. Furthermore, a huge part of what makes their relationship so special is how they plot together. They're manipulative, calculating, daring. They encourage the best of each other's intellect. Villanelle and Hannibal repeatedly are drawn to the way Will and Eve think. They're drawn to the dark complexity of their minds. For a majority of the show, Will and Hannibal are seen plotting against each other. But it's not a cat and mouse game because there is no mouse. There's no question that they're perfect matches for each other. And the same can be said for Villainy. They are identically different. The way that they think, their minds fit like a lock and key. As a woman, Villanelle's fine touches often go unrecognized, or they're diminished, because she's expected to be a tool, not an artist. Eve sees that, and it's a brilliant thing to have two unseen women truly look at each other like that. Will is able to recognize and name Hannibal's tactics, like a museum goer that can deduce exactly how a painter renders his masterpiece. And it's exciting, arousing even, to be truly seen like that, to have all your intentions pay off, for someone to know each hidden flourish that you baked into your work. I mean, it's the same reason everyone loves personality quizzes. We like being analyzed and having that deem us as lovable. But what makes this love so dangerous is the impulse for more, 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 this constant escalation that ends in... Hold on, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> attracted to each other. There's no brainwashing, no hunt, no games, nothing forcing them into each other's company. I honestly haven't seen Willowa media that portrays genuine chemistry between women like this. And then that one encounter manages to short-circuit Villanelle, like, it drives her so crazy she ruins her mission and goes on a killing spree. Now, I'm not saying that infatuation is a healthy basis for a relationship, in fact, that's what season one is about, pretense and the deconstruction of expectations. Villanelle is at first turned on by the remnants of Anna that she sees in Eve, what she wants out of Eve, and how she can mold her to be a maternal figure towards her. She flirts and spoils and orchestrates. Similarly, at first Hannibal sees Will as a plaything, an attractive man with a mind like a Rubik's Cube. If Will wasn't his equal, if he was just another pig, if he could have been the paternal figure to Abigail that Hannibal wanted, then they could have played house. And then, when Hannibal had his fill, he would have eaten them both. The teacup that he loves to talk about, this little vision of Will, has been knocked over by Will stumbling upon Hannibal's true nature. Naturally, his move is to protect himself, but this shared darkness they have, Will's own cunning, is enough to keep Hannibal from letting the teacup hit the ground entirely. A big difference in these characters' introductions to each other is that Will and Hannibal meet under a relatively more normal context. They are friends, and this friendship is at first approved of and seen as normal by their colleagues. No one suspects Hannibal of anything, somehow, but Eve and Villanelle only know each other as their true selves, as hero and villain. It's honestly a shame, because the banter and dynamic as a whole is so good that I wish it didn't take us forever to get scenes where they interact, but boy when they do. All the little gifts, all the flirty teasing moments, it's an appetizer from Hannibal and Villanelle, an invitation for Will and Eve to come play. And when they finally bite, when that teacup shatters, the story finally begins. Hello, Dr. Lecter. Season 2 starts with the marked, obsessed, the repercussions of crossing the point of no return. They're all guilty of each other. This is the season of schemes and seduction. Hello, Will. May I come in? Do you intend to point the gun at me? Not tonight. 
Hippolytus will realizes what Hannibal has done to him, how he's found a back door into his mind and exploited his disease, and after Hannibal kills his best friend Beverly, he gets his own pound of flesh. He gets a taste for blood, just like Eve did. Now that everyone knows the rules of the game, they're intoxicated by it. It's disturbing to the others around them how eager Will and Eve are to scheme and chase, how they still crave each other. In season two, Eve learns to play by Villanelle's rules, and Will manipulates Hannibal right back. He orders a hit on Hannibal, killing Randall Tear, pretending to kill Freddy, and he tells Jack it's all an act, but we the audience know better. Randall's murder in particular shows that there's truth in Will's boldest lies. I mean, for fuck's sake, he drops his gun to fist fight a guy in a mechanized fursuit and ends up punching the furry to death while picturing his cannibal boyfriend. And then in the most heartwarming tone, asks said boyfriend to help mutilate and display the furry's body in a museum all so they can speculate on the real killer's actual intent in the horniest episode of TV I've ever seen. I can't believe those words can even exist in the same context together. Eve gets more and more volatile, ordering a hit on herself of all people, testing Villanelle right back. They learn more about themselves, take control of their own narratives, and they enter this sort of honeymoon phase. They dance and blur, even indirectly having sex with each other via proxy. We see that no one really challenges or entertains them like each other. I haven't been gorged, drowned, plucked and roasted. Not yet. We have the infamous Ortolan scene, which manages to be more heated than any of the actual sex scenes in the show. And of course, Villanelle taunting Nico. I didn't know you had it in you. Good for you. You should try this with your wife. It's so much fun watching them at the height of their game. At the same time, Hannibal and Villanelle are losing the power they used to enjoy. Villanelle is too much of a liability, and it seems like the Twelve is ready to ship her off to a farm upstate. The FBI is finally closing in on Hannibal's true nature, even though he scapegoated Chilton. And so neither of them have any real choice except to run. And now that Will and Eve seem to be formidable partners, they think they can bring them along. But there's still one fatal mistake, one toxic cloud that obscures the paths to murder and true love. Expectation. Hannibal and Villanelle still expect them to play along, to suit their fantasies. They can't let go of control in the relationship. They need to be guiding, molding, transforming. Your Mind and Mizumono are both heart-wrenching episodes that show the flickering duality that keeps Hannah Graham and Will and Eve from seeing eye to eye. Will and Eve want to flee. They want to say fuck it and chase love. But they are normal people with obligations to the real world. They may not be good people, and they might not have anything to leave behind, but they aren't willing to be possessed. For Hannibal and Villanelle, fleeing is their lifestyle. They're unattached, and as they're told by others around them, they're incapable of love. But at the same time, there's this bug in their code that causes them to act against their nature, that makes them abandon their own safety for another human. But their holds are too strong, and they regress back to their old behaviors, and the seduction ends in critical condition. Honeymoon phase over. Teacup shattered. At least that's what they tell everyone. Eve and Will are retired from the FBI and MI6, estranged from anything resembling the past few years. Villanelle and Hannibal have found replacements in Southern Europe, just enough of a high to stave off the boredom. That is, until the forces that be send them chasing after each other again. For Christ's sake, Will spends the whole show fixing a boat motor, only to use it to sail after the man who gutted him so bad he needed a colostomy bag. They're both compasses, with their norths calibrated towards each other. It's difficult, because season 3 of Killing Eve would have been so much better if they just gave Eve the screen time she deserved, instead of that dreadfully unnecessary plotline with Kenny's death, and Geraldine, and this guy. I feel kind of bitter, because Eve is the protagonist of the show, and is so, so interesting. But Sandra O oh will eat no matter what, and when the Roman centurion comes across her old foe, they can't keep their hands off each other. <laughs> Hannibal sends Will a valentine, the three of swords reversed, which means reconciliation between lovers. We reach into Hannibal and Villanelle's pasts and unfold their original sins, the family they've been chasing after this whole time. We see that all they really wanted was closeness. 
I think it would have been interesting if, like Will, Eve traveled to Russia to discover the truth about her family, perhaps even led by Dasha. But Villanelle letting go of the mother she needed so badly is an important step in her moving forward. We learn through Chio and Dasha how Hannibal and Villanelle are facets of Will and Eve's darkness, the danger that lurks within them. Will rejects Hannibal following one and a half attempted lobotomies, causing him to turn himself in. It's a marked change from Hannibal sacrificing Will for his own freedom. This season, he willingly takes any punishment that comes his way, even though he clearly demonstrates that he can escape at any time. In fact, this season both Hannibal and Villanelle don't try to seduce. They simply let Will and Eve reciprocate, let them rage. The only thing that matters to him right now is waiting where Will can find him, no matter how long it takes. Likewise, Villanelle doesn't cling on to Eve anymore. She leaves her gifts still, but there's no bite to them, no expectation. For once, she's thinking with a future in mind. These two monsters have been irreparably changed by lovesickness, and Will and Eve know there's not much they can do to avoid it either. As season three draws to a close, there's one last moment, one last scheme. Will and Hannibal are teaming up to fake an escape and murder Dolleride, and Villanelle is ready to leave the Twelve, taking Eve with her. Will is now the seducer, practically batting his eyelashes at Hannibal, who is a slave to his own devotion. He tells Will, save yourself, kill them all, expecting Will to kill him along with Dolleride. He even positions himself in front of the window to block Will from the bullet. In the finale, Villanelle tells Eve the only thing they can do is take one last look at each other and walk away. She's far calmer than her possessive, pleading spite in season two. But Will and Eve have also changed. They're also able to let go. They have fully blurred this time, conjoined past the possibility of a separation. And so she turns around, and Will fights, and they fall. How does this answer our question? What does this say about true love and trauma bonding and abuse? We see that only once Hannibal and Villanelle relinquish possession and control can they see the truth of their partners. These two characters, defined by their hedonism and insatiable hunger, sacrifice their freedom for Will and Eve. Not to have them, not to win them, but as an offering, without any expectations in return. In all the bloodshed and terror, they have peeled away the layers of each other and found two identical souls. They can't live without each other, but it's the willingness to go without for their own sake that proves that this is something far more powerful than obsession. In the broader scope of queer narratives, it's refreshing to see that powerful love doesn't have to end in 2.4 kids and holding hands in a nursing home. We're allowed to shatter the heteronormative milestones of parenthood and settling down, and instead continue to elevate each other, forever expanding the limits of our potential, with our partner as a compass. They aren't husband and wife. They're two equals who see each other like a polished mirror. For someone with trauma, that kind of love seems impossible. Not many people are willing to try. I mean, you can't clean someone off without getting their dirt on you. But the idea of letting someone mutually mark you with no pity or pain, just for the thrill of solving a puzzle? Well, that's enough to make my heart skip a beat. And this is why Will and Eve's empathy is so important. Healing isn't a linear path, and for survivors of trauma, the lines between good and bad aren't black and white. They're more blue and orange. What redeems Hannibal and Villanelle is their capacity for love. Real love, not infatuation. That is the line between them and monsters. These are four people who live in their heads, who seek entertainment, control, and predictability. But they love each other because they can't control each other. Because they can never predict each other. And isn't that fantastic? The possibility that you can get what you need without having to ask for it? For women especially, we have such a distorted view of ourselves because we're constantly silenced and manipulated. We can't see ourselves, much less each other. We're so hungry to be seen, and this type of love is like a heightened fulfillment of that need. I wonder if this is how humans were meant to love each other. That we can trust enough to consume each other, but never doubt for a second the hold the other person has on you. I bet it feels like you're wide awake. If I saw you every day, forever, well, I would remember this time. Something I want to applaud both shows for is for their portrayals of intimacy. It's a difficult thing to earn from an audience, and sexual tension often gets mistaken for intimacy under the heat of seduction. I mean, that's what season two is about. But there's a feeling they share, even after that heat is gone, that afterimage. That's the indescribable truth of respect and love. The idea that your crimes are mine, that I will hold all the guilt and shame that burdens you. 
to offer up my own sins in exchange, recalling rather than repenting. And we root for this because we anticipate that convergence in our own lives. We wait for the day something finally happens. Personally, I prefer a more scientific explanation of things, so I'll put it this way. The strongest chemical reactions occur between alkali and halogens, opposites on the periodic table. The halogen is one electron shy away from stability, and lo and behold, the alkaline has an electron that they just can't wait to get rid of. And this exchange, this transferal, is violent, explosive, and the resulting bond is irreversible. It's an irreversible love. It hangs real and tangible in the air, in every scene. No one can deny it, because there's no pretense, and no abundance. And when you wonder if this is something you too can experience, you're suddenly inspired with hunger. A huge personal takeaway from Hannibal and Killing Eve is that not only can I, but I should want more. I should want someone whose aim is to see me, not just what they want out of me. I shouldn't be afraid of life. I should be so hungry that life is afraid of me. Hannibal lives every day indulgently because he knows how precious of a gift it is. Villanelle is uncompromising. When she doesn't get what she wants, she doesn't back down, she gets stronger. And I think we can all envy that attitude. And Will and Eve show us the doubts and euphoria of that envy. As a queer woman who's lived their life in a constant state of fear, I feel empowered by these shows. I realize that I am everything and I am far more than what the world has seen of me. In a world of barrier gaze, where we're told we don't get a happy ending, where we don't get the stories we deserve, Hannibal and Killing Eve remind us how unique and incredible our existence is. It doesn't tell us that our trauma makes us stronger, but rather that our strength comes from living in defiant triumph over that trauma. That we can struggle to survive and bite and bark and fight back. That there is power in the unconventional, in the feminine, in the queer. If you've made it this far, I want to thank you so much for listening to my first video essay. Naturally, this is all my interpretation, and I'm bound to disagree with all of this in the future. This video isn't sponsored, and I am a broke college student, so if you enjoyed me rambling or you'd like to see more content like this in the future, you can support me through my Ko-fi, or even just leave a like and a comment. And whenever possible, eat the rude.